Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date 2050 climate forecast for all our friends in New Mexico. I know we have a lot of folks here on the channel with an interest in New Mexico's climate outlook, particularly related to the resilience potential in the north of the state. In this video, we've got some interesting updates to the federal projections around heat increases and precipitation. You all know New Mexico's environment is not exactly mild. These updates will give you some insight as to what kind of wiggle room you've got as we move towards 2050. Taos, I got to tell you straight off, get on top of your zoning. As we get going, here's where to find my source material. This forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. We received the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 23. There have been significant changes in the projections in the new edition. We're updating the outlooks for every state. If you want to follow along, go to chapters, go to all figures, and that'll be the easiest way for you to find whatever figure numerically described that I'm talking about. The fifth national climate assessment represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document. You deserve access to the information. Today, we're breaking it down for New Mexico. FYI, American Resiliency is the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public. We run on donations. Let's get rolling. The conditions I'm modeling for 2050, we're talking about regularly hitting 2C as a global temperature increase. That seems like our most likely climate future. Even if we stay on target for emissions reductions, two is the best we're likely to get. We've blown through the realistic margin to limit warming to 1.5. Our reality is that we're going to be dealing with change. Looking at changes at 2C, Let's look at the national overview. You can see here in figure 1.14, New Mexico is mostly in the moderate change band with its northwest collar falling into Utah's ominous high change blob. Why we're seeing this blob emerge is unclear. It's a major change in the southwest projections from the NCA4, from the previous edition of the Federal Projections. I have had a lot of people tell me that my previous outlook for Utah was too optimistic based on their ground experiences. We're definitely seeing some validation of that here just at a glance as we're looking at the revised data. But let's get the focus back on New Mexico. I know no one pays enough attention to New Mexico, but that is probably better for keeping you under the radar because check this out. All right, so we're looking at figure 2.11 that has changes to hot and cold extremes. Let's zoom in here on New Mexico. I think that it is worth noting this extraordinarily good cool summer preservation in the mountains of northern New Mexico in particular. Very unusual, very optimistic for your high elevation communities in New Mexico. You've got a lot of opportunity here, a lot of potential to build resilience but you're so water limited. The last thing you need here is people who don't understand or respect the desert thinking they should come in and put in a nice green lawn. No one watching this should think this positive outlook that we're gonna see, especially for Northern New Mexico, is a everybody jump in the pool type outlook. Too much population increase around here would enormously reduce this area's potential for sustainability. All right, let's get focused here. Looking again at this increase in days over 95. As you can see in this figure, either you're hot or you're not. You can see in New Mexico, we're looking at some unusually good mountain cool preservation. And then if you're in a low elevation area, it's gonna get dramatically more toasty. Albuquerque, it's kind of hard to see where you are on this map. Let's orient by the Sandia Mountains. They're this wrench looking shape here, kind of in white. And you can see this is Albuquerque down in the valley next to the Sandias. So it looks like Albuquerque is mostly in orange, maybe making another three weeks of additional days over 95 every summer. So that's gonna be more energy demands for Albuquerque, but it's not as far as we see further south. Again, the Northern cities, they're looking really stable. No more than five additional days over 95 every year. Just awesome news for Northern New Mexico. Down in the southeast corner where we've got Roswell and Las Cruces, you can see an ominous, extremely red color. I would be concerned about this heat increase. That is significant. That's four to six weeks of increased dangerous temperatures. Either you got to get prepared to basically live on another planet or get out, especially because let's look over to the projected increase in warm nights. All right, zooming in on our warm nights map, we can see there is a big projected increase in warm nights in nights over 70, particularly down there in that southeast corner. In these southern desert areas, it used to cool off at night pretty reliably, but you can see we're expecting serious change. That increase in hot days is being matched down in the southeast by the increase in warm nights. This could be quite dangerous conditions. 
Here in the warm nights section of 2.11, this little blob up here is Albuquerque. So we've got a couple weeks increase in warm nights alongside those additional weeks over 95 during the day. You'll notice, I think, that the warm night increase in the Albuquerque area is affecting a much smaller part of the developed area than the daytime warming. That's reassuring in terms of your total energy needs. It means you'll probably be able to limit the heat island effect relative to other desert cities such as Phoenix. It looks like maybe two weeks of overall like super summer for Albuquerque by 2050. I know that's not great to hear, but that's a much lower change than Phoenix or Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. For people who want a warm desert city, like a good sized desert city, Albuquerque is probably your best bet as we look towards the future. You'll notice on this map that Taos and Santa Fe, you're both looking at a delightful absence of change in your projected warm nights. Let's look a little bit at the winter here. Let's look at the loss of cold days, the change in the number of days under 32, your change in freezing days for New Mexico. You can see we're facing cold loss across the state, two to three weeks less time below freezing with the loss of cold more dramatic in the mountains. So we need to note, mountain folks, this outlook for you, it's not change free. And the changes likely make your area more attractive in terms of climate for people from the outside. So get your zoning in order. Too much air development in these areas, it's very possible. You know as well as I do, it's a very bad idea. So let's get some more details on this winter change with an eye to plant hardiness zones. All right, so we're looking at 11.3 to get another look at the winter in terms of winter lows. How are your winter lows changing? That's gonna change your plant hardiness zones. This will be brief, then we're gonna start talking about water, which I know is the real story in New Mexico. I wanna say this looks not too bad, this shift. And I'm not gonna blare with you and zoom in and out, but for almost every location in the state, if you get in here and you look at where you live, you're talking about moving a half zone. So if you're in a 6A now, you'll move to a 6B. If you're in a 5B, you'll move to the 6A over the next 20 years. This is fairly hopeful. It's much lower than change in some parts of the country. If you look here at Michigan and Ohio, for example, by 2050, the change is, is so strikingly enormous and over a wide geographic area. In New Mexico, let's look in a little bit at these changes. We can see that stepwise change and that it's pretty smooth over the foothills. In some areas, we see change progress extremely rapidly in the projections where foothill species won't have time to get up the mountain. We see a more gradual winter transition in New Mexico. I think that's very hopeful for ecological stability. Anything that gives a living thing a little bit more time, we got to take whatever edge we can hold in this world we're living in. Now it's water time, though. Speaking of edges we can hold, I've got good news and bad news. You are right on the edge. I have a couple of different models for annual changes in precipitation by mid-century at two in the NCA5. You can see that here in figure 4.3, we do see that New Mexico is sort of being kissed by a potential line of increased precipitation. Whereas in figure 210 here, you're right below the line. In either case, in either of these figures, you can see some increased precipitation is projected for parts of Colorado that feed the Rio Grande. We'll get back to that in some more detail. This is an unusual change from the NCA4 to the NCA5 that we have even this thin chance of any increased precipitation for New Mexico. It's not going to surprise you. It's likely to come as occasional deluges. Let's look at the figure for that. Let's see where they're likely to come. All right, looking at figure 2.12, projected changes to precipitation extremes at 2C across all three factors that they're mapping out here, total precipitation on heaviest 1% of days, the five-year maximum daily precipitation, how big are your biggest storms going to get, and your annual maximum daily precipitation. On all three of these, we see some dark colors emerging in conserved locations of New Mexico with particularly strong signals to the west, especially up here in um, Navajo Nation. So this is important, any area with deluge potential, and we're looking at 15, 20% increases in your total precipitation on those days where you get a big monsoon rain. In your climate, you gotta think about flooding, especially flash floods. Anyone with desert experience can imagine how crazy an extra 20% rain and a big monsoon fall could be. 
you could get flash flooding in Arroyo's miles downstream that would just come out of nowhere. So there's that hazard and there's opportunity. You've got to be prepared for storage potential, water storage potential, particularly as we look at the conserved signal for major deluges up towards Navajo Nation and up by the Ute Reservation. And there's some signal for it down in those heat challenged areas by Roswell. So those deluges, they're both a challenge and an opportunity. Let's hope this figure is giving us an accurate heads up. I want to note in our previous outlook on New Mexico, we saw no sign at all of any potential increase in precipitation. Northern New Mexico did not appear to have even a sporadic increase band. It wasn't even marginal. We were talking about a pure groundwater approach to New Mexico's resilience in the face of an extreme drought trend. So this is all pretty cool. It's still a drought trend, but it's less severe than we saw last time. It's still very dry, but it's not as bad as it could be. And that's the kind of margin of hope we operate on in the Southwest, right? Looking back to our thinking about the groundwater, in New Mexico, we got two major aquifer systems of concern. I know that this map is obviously for Texas, but it was one of the best I could find still for the aquifer systems in New Mexico. You can see that we're over the Rio Grande aquifer system and the High Plains aquifer system. The High Plains aquifer over towards the eastern edge of the state, we're all very concerned about this aquifer. The outlook is poor. We're likely to see continued depletion. However, there is potential for stability in the Rio Grande aquifer system. Let's look back to figures 2, 10, and 4.3, because we need to look at where your groundwater is coming from. So this is back in figure 2, 10. I want you to look uh, not just at New Mexico, but up north at Colorado and down south to that southern border and by Arizona, because this is a thing we don't talk about very often. But your little corner of the world is actually modeling a little better at 2C than 1.5C. I'm not saying that we should hope to go to 2C. I mean, globally, this is bad news. But... Why not identify a positive where you see it, right? We can see that Colorado is projected to be getting a little bit more water at 2C and that the drought trend is likely to be a little bit less insane, a little bit less statistically severe for the Southwest at 2C. If Colorado gets serious about water conservation, which they are, more water could make it to where the Rio Grande goes underground. Looking over at 4.3 as well, Unfortunately, I think that we need to see across both figures that this drying trend around the systems that feed the High Plains aquifer system that would feed this eastern edge of the state, there's a severe drought trend that is conserved across models. It looks very challenging for the High Plains aquifer. So we see potentially a tiny edge of hope for the Rio Grande aquifer system for the water system that nourishes so much of New Mexico. And I know in other places, this wouldn't be enough hope. Here, this hope should be cautious. Water conservation will be even more important in the future than it is now. But any hope that we have any stability in the groundwater, I know New Mexico is capable of making the most of such hope. I mean, look at the work that's already been done in Albuquerque and recharging local aquifers and stabilizing local groundwater levels. The work that's been done on water in New Mexico is some of the most inspiring water resilience work in the entire country. And up in northern New Mexico, the Asequia water systems that have been used there by communities for hundreds of years, they're well suited to continuing to provide water stability in this emerging climate, this drier, warmer climate, more so than the systems used in other water-stressed parts of the Southwest, which tend to be more aligned to lines on a map and less aligned to the way water actually lies with the land. Many of our communities with the best climate stability in New Mexico, they're also operating off this potentially relatively stable Rio Grande aquifer. And their landscapes also are drawing off of that groundwater. So it's a potential reinforcing cycle of stability that we can see has potential to emerge. It's all a very hopeful edge in the projections and it's a delicate edge. And here's something that should help scare people off. If you're going to get a good rain or two in a desert landscape, you know what that means next year is, is wildfire, right? Let's look at the fire map. So this is figure 7.4. If you've seen me use the fire map before in this series, you already know this is my most hated figure in the NCA5 because of its crazy key. The figure gives an impression of information that is, I would say, almost deliberately obscuring. But you can see it's showing a lot of information in New Mexico if we could figure out where New Mexico is in this crazy series of lines. So 
let's look at how to get some overview information here. We want to look at projected change at mid-century. The key is in change in number of days as a percent. So in this area that encompasses New Mexico, you can see a number of colors here looking at about 150 to 200 to 350. So that means 150 to 350 percent increase in your number of days where you have a danger of large fires. You can see that historically you would have up to about 0.25 days every fire season that had conditions for extremely large fires. So maybe one really dangerous day every four years. If you've got a 350% increase, you're gonna be talking about every year having a day where the conditions are present for very dangerous fires. That is a lot of fire risk for very large fires. Wildfire danger in New Mexico is already pretty serious. There have been successes with land management using fire in the landscape. And then there was that big fire in 22 that started out as a controlled burn, got majorly out of control, became the largest fire in the state's history. Interesting, terrible note regarding that, the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico, they got a big rain after that fire and washed a bunch of ash into the Galinas River, thus into their water supply. It was a serious water crisis. They were down to 40 days of clean water before they got a treatment installed that could remove the ash and the sediment that had polluted the river. So it's a complex situation and it's an understatement to state that learning to manage fire in this changing landscape is a real challenge. I wanna take just a second and talk about resilience because the NCA5 gives New Mexico low resilience scores. Let's check it out, figure 28.8. See, they say that New Mexico is like the worst in the Southwest overall, right? Like darkest color, lowest resilience. I don't believe this figure. I think that any way you calculate a resilience score for Navajo Nation and it comes up low is nonsense. This figure I say just measures who is rich in dollars. In New Mexico, I know there are many of you who are rich in knowledge and community and may it be that you are rich in land. No one smart would count you out, but plenty of smart people would like to buy you out. I hope that you can see these projections and see how many people would like to enjoy your objectively rare, very pleasant climate that we see in these projections. I hope you see this information and I hope you see that there's a solid edge to hold, particularly in Northern New Mexico. You're in a place where you can get ready. You're in the right place to build communities that are serious about water conservation and that are serious about sustainability. If you can get into distributed solar, you could get all the power you need it. For much of the state, the biggest challenges revolve around fire, increased low elevation heat, and especially in the south of the state, this continuing severe drought trend. But in the outlook, there's also some real hope for New Mexico. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for listening in. And I'd also like to thank all of the donors and volunteers who contribute to American Resiliency. If you are interested in giving, please check out the donation link on our About page on the YouTube channel or go to our website, www.americanresiliency.org. We are a registered 501c3. If you send us direct donations, they are tax deductible. Thanks to the generosity of this community and both funding and time, we've really been able to step up the quality of our videos for these updated forecasts. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here with me. Let's get ready together.